This is New England Soccer Weekly with Tom Quinlan, Nick Giuliano, and Mike DeSilva on 790 The Score. Oh, well, the uh, entire complexion of the 2023 season has just changed a little bit. But oh, regard oh 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 like yeah. you're surprised you well, just not like, watch what happened on saturday can, night can you welcome the audience in can you say hello it's doing <laughs> yeah. soccer weekly you've we have an Tom, open that does that i've like, got mike why stop that we have an open that does that <laughs> i i'm getting right to it this is not good right now if you're a new england revolution fan there's a lot to figure out how you move forward in the post dylan barrero era because you're not seeing them till 2024 so it's time to get things together and It'll be interesting to see how this team is tested this weekend versus Toronto FC, who came, was coming off a big win at home last weekend against New York City FC. Granted, you got a nice little draw against uh, FC Cincinnati, so you're still riding that first place momentum. A lot, uh, uh, just a lot happening right now in New England Revolution land. So let's preview this weekend's match. You happy I got to it now, Nick? It was it was okay. I give it six point three. That was good. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's get to this weekend's match and preview what's going to be going on between the Revs and Toronto FC with the woman who'll be on the call for this weekend, MLS analyst for uh, MLS season pass, Kendra de St. Aubin. Kendra, welcome to Providence. How are you? I'm great. Thanks for having me, guys. I appreciate it. Got a pretty exciting game this weekend between the Revs and uh, Toronto. And I just said it right there. A big one nothing win at home versus New York City FC last week. We talked with Taylor Twelman a couple weeks ago, and he said that at some point he thinks that Toronto is going to get it together here. And that win last weekend versus... Um, New York City FC might be the momentum builder that they need to kind of get themselves some footing here in the Eastern Conference. Yeah, I mean, I think it's helpful, too, that you have Insigne and Bernadeschi back on the field at the same time. Clearly, you can see their quality. You can play them in the wider up front areas. Um, Because even in the previous match, Bob Bradley had said, he's like, it was my bad. You know, the way I played, I tried to play Bernadeschi and Insigne up top almost in a two front. They hadn't trained that way at all. It wasn't a good choice by us when they got smoked by Philadelphia. And so now adding CJ Sapong as like a real true number nine in the middle of those two. I think that this could, this could really start to take off because they have enough veteran quality. They have some good defensive pieces. You've got Sean Johnson in goal. So, you know, there are a lot of good things. If they can get Michael Bradley back, you know, he's been injured. Um, he's a key cog in the midfield. Osorio's out. So there are some things with this Toronto. It's like, it's kind of maybe like, you know, you guys have experienced in New England, two steps forward, one step back sometimes with the injuries. You get a guy healthy and then another guy goes out. And it's that whole quote unquote kind of cliche next man up mentality. But Toronto, if they can get all their pieces together and get, you know, keep this on the roll. And I think, too, you score a goal and you don't allow any. Because I did another match there earlier this year where they went up 2 nil and then they gave up two goals against Charlotte. So it could, you know, I think the the key piece is, is they hung on to it. They got the clean sheet. So there was a couple positives there um, on the night for Toronto. A player that stuck out to me watching this team back is uh, Richie Larea, and coming off of the right back, he's a he's a player a lot like the backs we've seen in New England that gets forward. He scored a couple goals recently. He had the assist in uh, against NYCFC. So how does a player like that his dynamic work with the Bernadeskis and the Insignes like you just mentioned? Well, it's crazy because in the first half of that last game, I had actually mentioned, you know, Richie Larea, like he is this guy that is just with the wingbacks these days, like what they can do and how much they have to run. And they're like so different than the outside backs from my era. That's for sure. We were like, you stay back there. You don't come forward. We're not expecting you to do anything offensively. And he is incredibly dynamic because in the second half, he lit it on fire. He was like the Richie Larea I was expecting to. Uh, to see. And I do think the more he plays with Bernadeschi on that side, as we all know, the chemistry sometimes between the outside backs, the wing backs, and the player in front of them is almost as important as any other pairing on the field. In all my years of covering Minnesota United, it was the same way. Once you get to figure out a player's tendencies, do, when do they want to cut in? When do you, should you overlap? When should you cut in as the outside back? It just is a whole other dynamic. And it's going to be a handful for New England to handle when you have outside backs like that like a Richie Larea that can come forward and be so effective. And he just keeps on going, you know, he doesn't slow down and um, just another attacking piece that can really find, find his way. And when Matt Hedges is in that center back role alongside of him, it allows him even more freedom, you know, to get up because he knows that Hedges will cover. You mentioned Bernadeschi too, who's obviously very dangerous offensively. One of the 
parts of the New England defense that they've struggled with in this early part of the season is set pieces. And Bernadeschi, I know you watch the, these games week in and week out. It seems across soccer that free kicks are, are still something that, that need to be worked on. But his corners, his uh, set pieces, they always are dangerous. So is that something that New England should definitely be aware of going into this game? Well, for sure. And now when you add a CJ Sapong in the mix, you know, I mean, I, I witnessed Bernadeschi's Olympico, you know, a couple of weeks ago, which was like aided by a 70 mile an hour wind gust um, on a corner kick. But yes, in general, I think when now you have um, the set piece opportunities, I think he's magical. And, and Insigne is really not that much different coming from the other side now where he cuts it in on his right. Um, or if he takes a set piece from from the left hand side and tries to pick out that top corner curling it around you know we've all seen it and you know, you've got a phenomenal goalkeeper at new england one of the best in the league right now but there's sometimes where there's certain guys that can strike a ball and you know exactly what they're going to do and you still can't stop it no matter where you put the wall no matter how you set them up no matter what position you take between the pipes there are guys that can curl that ball in and um, whether it's on a corner character or a set piece and Bernadeschi is absolutely one of those guys and now when you have another piece in there like a cj sapong that could get on the end of it or He's always poaching. He will be ready for anything that comes back out. So it's the second ball oftentimes now. I think that Toronto could be even more effective. And then lastly, before we move on to the revolution, and you mentioned it uh, to start, the this team is very even statistically. They have six draws, 13 goals for, 13 against, but they have been playing, I guess, the Philadelphia game aside, better soccer. So what do you think the difference is now going into week 11 than maybe it was to start the season? Is it the injuries or is it something else? I think it's literally just, and it's it sounds really cheesy, but sometimes it's just confidence. When you, once you can get a result, and they had so many draws, and that's like nice when you're on the road to get a draw, but when you're at home and you're getting draws, or when you're at home and you're not hanging on to leads, it can be really deflating. It can be a little bit frustrating. And then on top of that, you go and you have that Philadelphia result. And it was funny because Mark Anthony Kay, we talked to him after that Philadelphia game, and it was like, you know, the wheels are falling off, like chicken little, sky is falling. And, you know, we need to get it together. We need to be on the same page. We need to do this. We need to do that. We need to simplify the game. And we talked about Bradley. We asked him the same thing. And he was like, he chuckled. He's like, I've coached Mark Anthony for a long time. And he's like, I don't know if he's just talking about himself or he's talking about the whole team here. But, you know, we have things that are working for this team. The sky is not falling. The wheels are not falling off. It was a not a good result against Philly. We did not come to play. We were out intensified, basically. So I think that this team... As, as they continue to click offensively, is C.J. Sapong going to play every minute of every game the rest of the season? Absolutely not. But Iowa Canola is not a, really a part of what they're doing. Adama Diamande is not really a part of what they're doing for some reason. So they are going to have to continue to find goals from elsewhere. And if they can continue to find that, I think they'll be okay. I mean, this is a good roster. It's one of those things where you look at it and you're like, how are they not better? I you know, that, and we've when we've talked to yeah. different Apple personalities, this is the team that they bring up that a has lot. been at the bottom of the table. But Toronto FC is that team to watch out for. Well, how how much of how important has it been to have Bob Bradley sort of steer the ship here? Because it feels like not a lot of coaches would be able to get out of this hole that Toronto's built themselves into pretty early here. Yeah, and I think it's his pedigree, it's his nature, it's his I've been there, done that through everything. I mean, look at New England last year, right, even compared to this year. And Bruce Arena, when you have these two legendary coaches and what they've been able to accomplish and what they've been through, I think that Toronto and Bob Bradley is the guy that can steer this ship because Toronto has been bad now for quite a few seasons. And I know Bob Bradley's only been there for a, a, a you know a short window of time, but um, I do think that his situational awareness, his – I've been in the ups and the downs and these and, and managing the personalities. And I think we forget that sometimes too, with these guys, these big money guys, these international players that come in, you're melding a lot of personalities. You're trying to get youngsters sort of into the mix. You're trying to get your veterans to step up and lead. I think when you have a coach like Bob Bradley that can weather that storm. And he said that too. He's like, look, I listen to everybody in the room when they have feelings like that after the Philly game. But then he's like, I step in and make sure that we're getting the right message going forward, that the wrong information isn't getting put out there to continue on because you don't want guys, if you're trying to build confidence, you don't want guys to feel like the sky is falling. So I think Bob Bradley and his personality and the way what he's been through um, kind of is going to steer this ship, hopefully in a positive direction, because as we all know, 
the more good teams you have in this league, the better and the more parity there is. And you have these rivalries and you have these coaches and, and this quality like an Insignia and a on a roster – you know, the more fun it is for everybody and the more attention it will attract internationally. I know you said that this weekend is going to be the first time you're going to see the Revs up close and personal So uh, for this season. Your just general thoughts on New England to this point sitting, with them sitting in first place. Well, I think the best thing about this, and going back to that point about youngsters, is Bruce Arena has been able to a lot, rely on a lot of guys, a lot of you know, 17, 18-year-olds that have stepped in filled some gaps. And then you've got these quality veterans like an Ema Boateng who steps in, scores the goal last week and against a, in a very gritty kind of, you know, ugly, whatever you want to call it, FC Cincinnati game because of the nature of, you know, sitting atop. Of course, you lost Dylan Barrero, which is a massive hit. But I do think when you look at this roster and how they play, I mean, if you have Carlos Steele on the field, you you have a pretty good shot at doing something. I know he's only got four assists on the season, but it's early. You're only 10 games in. I think when you've got a guy like that can work some magic, you've got a player like Justin Rennix, you've got other youngsters that are stepping up at the midfield. And I do think um, Veroni is a, maybe a revelation. You guys have seen him up close and personal more than me. And I know he's not insanely young, but the 23-year-old to come over here and, and do what he's done early on in, in the season and, and score a few goals. And I do think when you have these exciting pieces and Petrovic, I mean, are you kidding me? Like with the goalie, right? Like, if you got a good goal, you can go a long way. I mean, we—I don't know. Do you guys ever cover hockey? Because it's the same way. You get a hot goalie. I mean, Matt Turner. We had know? Matt Turner here. Yeah. True. Well, of course. But I mean, a young. Yeah, but I mean, for him to fill those shoes at a young age and yeah. an international goalkeeper, I mean, that's that's a lot of pressure to and fill he might in be better for than a Matt Turner. Turner. I think that's right? what we've got. That's the conclusion we've come to. He might. He's. He's probably. That's what Taylor told me said a few weeks ago. And, it's and and nobody. Well, and if Taylor said that. it, it's gospel. If Taylor said it, it's gospel. <laughs> right? I mean, it's got. It's got to be right. <laughs> Especially around here. You're gonna right. Talking, you're going to be talking to Bruce today. We're recording here on Thursday before uh, game match day. What are some of the things that you're looking forward to in terms of learning from Bruce about this team? Well, I want to know kind of how he's going to navigate this storm because every question that was asked post game and then midweek was about Dylan Barrero, right? I mean, and you guys know firsthand the the loss. Yeah, the guy to the my loss left very that... much knows about that. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he started the show with that. He's coming in hot, hot takes, That's right? Yeah, the rats. Um, That's what you get here. But, <laughs> but it, it is a big piece. It is a big piece to miss. But you also have to, if you're the coach, you have to navigate that. You can't have that be it. I mean. I covered Minnesota United for six years. Emmanuel Reynoso hasn't showed up from Argentina. And the sky is falling. You know, they thought it was there, right? But the next man up mentality, you have to calm the nerves inside the locker room. Is just because you're missing your guy. You have to figure out who is going to – you have to build confidence in the rest of your group. Mm-hmm. Latif Blessing, is he going to be back now more full-time? It's just, you know, with his family arriving and all that stuff. So I just think that from, from Bruce Arena – I've interviewed him a lot of times for other things. And I'll tell you what, his demeanor hasn't changed. Whether you just went on a 35-game winning streak or a 35-game losing streak or you allowed 10 goals or you scored 10 goals, this guy is incredibly even keeled. He's always got the you know the facial expressions to boot. And I just want to talk to him and, and kind of find out what's the temperature in the room. And we're lucky in the sense that we – these MLS Apple calls that we do, that we get kind of the off the record vibe. I mean, sometimes you get a feel from these coaches and information that you can get a real pulse on what's going on. A guy that Bruce Arena brought in from Nashville, Dave Romney, has stepped in and really done a tremendous job on this back line. He's a lot of people 10 games in. their MVP of the team right now, along with Carlos Seal. So my, my question to you is, I don't think people realize how difficult it is to come from a system to go to another system and make this early impact. So what have you seen from Romney so far? Well, I think in the position that he plays as well, in the center midfield role, or I mean, excuse me, the center back role, and then depending on who he's paired with, right? And then look at the two center mids or the holding mids, whatever you want to call them in the system Bruce plays in front of him. How much easier does it make that transition? He's fortunate, Romney, clearly. He's a veteran of this league. He's played in this league. He's from MLS, so it's not coming like an international move, which we see that struggle a lot. And I think we're even more surprised when an international center back comes in and you get a pairing where you don't speak the same language. But he's also partnered oftentimes with Farrell, who's another MLS veteran of this league. So when you have that kind of a communication and you can rely on your two center backs and then you have that spine of the team that can just – I'm I'm a firm believer in that your center back pairing and your holding mid pairing – or if it's a one holding mid, whatever system they decide to play, or how if it's a double pivot, however they like to go with a six or an eight. 
I think that that's their that's worth their weight in gold these days. And people underestimate that value of a holding mid dropping in and filling in for a center back that has to step out the communication there. So I think Romney has not missed a beat. They're incredibly fortunate to have gotten him and then to partner him with Farrell, if that's the choice. And I know he hasn't played as many games this season as, as in, you know, as many minutes thus far, but I do think that, that is undervalued and underestimated. I also think if you notice the whole league is down in general with goals scored. And I think people are investing more in their defense because it was all about the number nines. It was all about the goal scoring. And they were starting to go, Hey, wait a minute. What do we have Four DP center backs now that have been signed in the history of this? That was never a thing before, you know, and then Walker Zimmerman made a big splash when he was signed to a DP contract. Like there's importance put now, I think on, back lines, center backs, and, you know, you're holding midfield, you're six, you're eight, whatever it might be. All right. Kindra de St. Aubin on the call this weekend with Matt Cullen, the Revs and Toronto FC. A big game this weekend for the Revs after everything that they've gone through this weekend. Plus, they haven't had many uh, away games this yeah, year. Yeah, long they've home stretch there done, for a while. Yeah, they've done – but here, here's the thing. They've done fairly well on the road minus that LAFC game. So it's going to be interesting to what see what – What was up with that? What, what was up with game, that LAFC? Right? We it called was, yeah. that the anomaly game yeah. because <laughs> it was early on the season. You Gustavo tra- Bo was just c- coming back. Cross country. Yeah. yeah. It was Carl- Carlos Hill was hurt. Wasn't there Sunday night random prime like like t- it was a late game? I think Barrero played in that. I thought he didn't. Call, I thought he was. He got hurt. No, Barrero was on international. Yeah, oh, that's right, South yeah. Korea. Yeah, yeah. So that it was it was just a weird game. Yeah, anomaly just, game. Yeah. Anomaly game. That game shouldn't be played. That <laughs> it's early one of those games you just like nah, it didn't happen. Yeah, no. Well, what's the inside scoop though on Bruce? I mean, you guys see him all the time. Like, is there something I should ask him that well, he'll be like, how does she like? How does she know this? You know. You know the the guy in the blue is the guy to ask. He's a, he's good friends with Bruce. Tom uh, Quinn. I'm pretty Tom sure. Tom the fourth. I'm pretty sure that he's been invited to Thanksgiving. We're not sure, but he might have been. Yes. Uh, but yeah, t- t- Tom, why don't you give a little insight as to what your I- experience is with Bruce on and a your weekly relationship basis? Relationship with the coach. I think he likes you guys a hell of a lot more than he likes us. I think it's that simple. Yeah. To, as it said, I'll, I'll tell you this. I asked him the other day. I said. Because they've had injury issues now for two seasons here. You know, Henry Kessler's hamstring injury, uh, that's something that lingered from last year to this year, and now he's out for the next four months. And we'll talk about that in a little bit because I do have some news there. Um, Barrero's ACL injury. I mean, these these guys have had injuries just come compa- Andrew Farrell was hurt last year, and then he was hurt. This, uh, the whole to start Turner to be- incident last year. The whole Turner. <laughs> like, and I, I brought it up. I said, does it feel like you just can't catch a break right now? And his response was, "Well, what do you want us to do? Pack it up and go home?" Yeah, he was not happy. He with was, me. but 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 you know, I, I I do think he's starting to feel you know, all of this stuff continuing. Like, but but on the upside, you know, as much as you want to, you could uh, bemoan that you're still sitting in first place. So, I mean, you got to take the good with the bad. And I think the biggest difference is having this youth. Um, here right now that you didn't have last year that's more mature, that's uh, more ready to meet well, the moment. And I think they've done a great job stepping in when they've had guys go down. Kendra, two ways to butter them up uh, with your conversation <laughs> with him shortly is to uh, talk about the, the up-and-coming talent that he has. He's very proud in, in, you know, of, of Noel and, and the other guys that he has coming up through the ranks. And also complain about the refs. He loves doing those two things. <laughs> VAR. He if, hates yeah, VAR. VAR. If, you, yes. if you roast VAR and the refs, and you know, cre- give him credit for the young talent on the revs. He would be very happy, and you'd be, you'd be friends for life. Well, and he could roast him on our broadcast call, you know, without getting fined. So he might en- he might enjoy that platform. You Even know, better. So. I love it. Even yeah. better. Yeah, yeah. And I understand the injury bug and the injury issues, but I'll tell you what: has anybody seen the Portland Timbers? You know, I mean, I've done them now for you know, clearly when I was in the Western Conference, but even this year. I, it's unbelievable. Like every year, it's like eight guys. I mean, Sebastian Blanco hasn't stepped on the field again. And Evander, their $10 million guy, it's it's crazy. It feels like every team goes to this to some extent. It's just how well have you been able to backfill. And I think that is where New England is incredibly fortunate at this point right. that they've been able to rely on 18-year-olds to step in and play really solid. And oh, to be 18 and play 90 minutes for three games in a week. That's oh. like, I haven't I done mean, that since I was well, 12. That too, but, but you <laughs> yeah, also, you mentioned really. Andrew Farrell. He's coming in for Henry Kessler off an injury. That's And we talked about in the show, that's a veteran that a lot of rosters don't have as well. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. Exactly. That you have a guy that can fill in and, and separate in and knows the system and <laughs> knows how to handle Bruce. I mean, half the time that's the battle, right? <laughs> I'd say more than half at this point. But you know, he 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 bounced back from. I think he took what 
2022 wasn't yeah. and built on it in the off season and, and, you know, really focused on that. And they're in a better position now than they were definitely last year, depth wise, uh, going into this weekend though, before we let you go, what, what's your take? What do you see? Do the injuries, uh, going on the road for the first time in a while affect the revs or do you think that they can pull through? I think the revs can pull through, but I honestly, I think this one might come down to the coaches. This might be like a cat and mouse chess game of two guys that know each other so incredibly well and have been around this game for so long. I'm not saying they're going to like, you know, change their whole formation and change how they want to play, but who executes what they do the best in this moment makes the right substitutions that the game is tight going down the stretch. And the revs are tough at home. It's finally going to be a nice day. It's been crap weather there. Yeah. Every time I've been there, it's going to be a beautiful day. Although I think the Maple Leafs are playing maybe the next day. So who knows what that does to the fan base, but you know, it's, it's going to be a great game and I'm excited and I'm hoping it's not like a zero zero, even though there could be fun zero zeros. I'm thinking, you know, it could be, they could end up with a draw, but maybe it's like two, two or a three, two. I don't think honestly, Barrero is a big, Big shot to you guys, but to the Revs, but I don't, I don't know. I, I think you've got plenty of quality that can step in and fill the way. He, they won't be a like for like, but they're going to have to figure it out. Kidra de say Aubin, tell Bruce we say hi. <laughs> I will do. Thanks, guys. Specifically Appreciate it. from Tommy yes, Quinlan. Tom Quinlan. <laughs> Back with more I after will, this. I will start the call. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Kendra de St. Aubin. She was awesome. awesome. Welcome back into New England Soccer Weekly on this Saturday. We've been lucky with these Apple personalities every They're week. They're awesome. This is the most Fantastic. fun I've ever had covering that, our that's MLS. That's how you know they, didn't, they weren't messing around with their hires. Everybody's great, fun, knowledgeable. knowledgeable. Just really, really good. It is. We have said this though that once you these once you've talked to them, you can see why Apple hired them. Be, oh, absolutely. Because they they have the knowledge, but they do have that infectious personality. You you want to keep talking. You don't want to get off. Yeah, you know, yeah. It's good. She and I tell you one thing: if she didn't have a call to get on with Bruce, she probably would have stuck around. I agree. Probably would have stayed the whole show today. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> probably next next time we'll do the full forty eight. That's it. All right. So here we go. Dylan Barrero done for the season. Found Tough. that out earlier this week. Tough. There's no official update on what exactly the injury is. Um, that's Tom's phone. That's Bruce calling. Uh, yeah, exactly. Bruce is calling everybody. He knows they're about to play that clip. <laughs> <laughs> but I think, you know, regardless of whatever the injury is, you have to – you know that you can move on now and you just – you got to figure out what's going to happen with Barrero down the road. Um, clearly – all three designated player slots are taken, right? Mm -hmm. And Barrero is part of that U22 designated player's slot. So my first thought when you find out that this is likely a season-ending injury for Barrero and considering his you know, special designation, do the rules allow the Revs to be able to go out there and find a Barrero replacement until 2024 at least, right? And Jonathan Seigel from formerly of the... Bent Musket, now the Blazing Musket, and now he's over at MLSsoccer.com, uh, pretty much had the same question that I did. Quote, Dylan Barrero's season-ending injury, my understanding is the Revs can sign another U22 initiative player as long as their salary budget doesn't exceed Barrero's. So the Revs can go out there and replace Barrero for the remainder of the season and find somebody that's just as good. That player just can't cost more than what the Revs got Barrero for initially. You follow? They can't, oh, that, yep. It would be nice if they could get somebody for the price of what they most likely will sell Dylan Barrero for in the future. True. That'd be nice. Well, I mean, who knows what he's going to be after this, right? I mean, this yeah. is one of those True. injuries that... I mean, he's a young kid. He's strong. Like, he's very athletic. So I, I, I can't see him not being able to bounce back from this. But you never know. Like, these are serious injuries. Um do I want to lean towards it's an ACL injury? Most likely. But again, we haven't gotten that official diagnosis declaration. And by, yet. Maybe, and maybe by the time you hear this, there will be an official injury listed. But as it stands right now, we do know Bruce said he's, he's out for the season. Right, and right now, yeah, he's out for the season. If you want to go down that road where you want to replace Barrero, you have to wait until July 5th. So they got to ride this roster right now, and you're really going to learn a lot about these young guys. This is the season of the academy players. It really is, when you think about it, because... Well, it is, but also, I think, 
a, a pretty good plug-in who had a really good game on Saturday night is Ima Boateng. He's someone that could definitely step in. I on still that like him off the. He, yeah, he can step in. I mean, he started. He scored, but outside and I talked to Mike about this. Outside of scoring, he he really was involved both ways. He he's not. Dylan Barrero type talent, but to me, as a plug in, he gets to the July, job done. He gets the job done. But I'm not, I'm not denigrating what you're saying either. You have Noel Buck, you have Esmir, you have a Jack, you have all these kids that can play as well. So uh, again, the depth which you mentioned as a problem, those are four names that could be a serviceable uh, player to come in. Well, your depth got you over the hump the other night versus Cincinnati. Sure. I thought once Barrero gets taken out. Um, I forget who exactly came in, but you had to. No, Esmir. I think it was Jack P, right? No, no, Esmir. 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 Esmir came in. Yes. thought he did a really good job. Yeah, I thought, I, I thought, I thought he good. did a really good job. I actually was really impressed with the way he was playing. You know why um, I like Esmir? Because he shoots. He looks he to shoots, shoot, and he shoots. He's, aggr- he's aggressive. They're not afraid. These and, kids are not afraid. And the best thing about these young guys is they just they have the stamina. They have the fitness. They're all, they're all, in, they're all you know, well fit, and they can go through, play it. They, need, they could play 90 minutes if they had to. Um, but I do see there being... Most likely, you're going to see Bruce go to find somebody to replace Dylan, whether it be in the starting role or somebody to come off the bench for some of these younger guys if he doesn't want to go with them a full 90. But you have the, depth, the money. The, you have the money, and the depth is there already. And you might be getting some more money. Yeah, right. You don't need a game breaker, but you need some, you're going to need to fill that role. Well, here's the thing about FC Cincinnati in that game. That first half was. Awesome. Yeah. I mean, it was a fun game outside of the injury, which a lot of teams wouldn't have bounced back from as quickly as the Revolution did. It's a mental fortitude in Game Ten, watching that happen, watching a player get carted Something off. Something they wouldn't have done last year. And and they that that was a great back and forth with those two teams. The second half, though. I thought the Revolution played much better than mm-hmm. FC Cincinnati. I think the draw was fair at the end of it, but yeah. if you're watching this team and you're looking for positives in a draw. There was a lot in that second half. No, I thought. Listen, I'm not going to come in here and try to play up some fake anger. Like I thought for everything, you know, there's been fake anger in the past that you played up. No, I'm not. But 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 there's a way you can come in here and be just uh, nitpicky. And I'm yeah. just there's no there's no reason to that act game, like that today with a substantial loss that you faced early on with Dylan Barrero with how physical Cincinnati was playing. I mean, they were playing borderline dirty. Plus, you didn't at have times. You, you didn't have. Gustavo or Bobby forward. Wood or Giacomo Rioni. Yeah, so it's like in there. you in Rennix. You overcame a lot on Saturday. He was night. not it. Yeah. You really did. That's why I think the tie was fair, but uh, they they were borderline deserving of a win. All of those hurdles, and again, the way that they played in that final forty-five, the the last the the stoppage time is actually when uh, FC Cincinnati had a scare. But the the Revolution's final forty-five was pretty good. What you hate to see if you're Petrovich is having this absolutely ridiculously outstanding game where you save a penalty shot, you're making all these crazy reaction saves, and then this little dinky corner kick, which almost header, could have happened, which almost. it just caught him off guard. You know what I mean? Like it, it literally just caught him off guard, and I. I think the corner kick came from a missed call, wasn't it? Wasn't there like a missed foul like pr- just prior to the corner kick? Or the, maybe I'm mis- mixing up a different match. Yeah. But there, there, there was, was a lot of questionable things that happened. Well, Cincinnati. I, th- I think both VAR reviews, I would have went the other way. Well, Andrew l- Andrew Farrell, that was a penalty kick. That was a penalty that kick. That was a penalty kick. The got... handball was outside of the box. <laughs> right. so and honestly, I would have <laughs> – live. You know, I don't typically like to live tweet the games, but there are times where, you know – there are things I like to be said. Andrew Farrell's dad liked my tweet about there potentially being a red card in this game because I, I thought it was trending that way. The way Cincinnati, they were coming in late, they were their hands were all over them. Uh, Andrew Farrell's dad liked my tweet, and then I was then gonna tweet after that 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 was one hundred percent a penalty kick, but I didn't have the heart in it. <laughs> in case he you saw it again, I was late take the light back. So I was like, "How did I lose a like?" Oh, it was Andrew Farrell's dad. Andrew was late to that. It, I, I don't necessarily blame him. It was a yeah. bang bang type of play. No, but that was a foul. But it was a foul. It was a penalty kick. Yeah, and, and I think that that might have been like a maybe a little bit of a makeup by the ref. For well, some I, of the other ones. but how can you do that? And again, how does the the VAR in the first one show penalty kick when the handball clearly happened outside of the box, way outside the box? That's what I mean. So wh- both of them should have went the other way. I yeah, VAR handballs are a point of contention right now in soccer in general all over the world. It's now being discussed in Europe, uh, an actual like to find an actual definition of what a handball is because it appears that it doesn't make any sense. That one, his hand was out there. I thought it was a handball. It was ball, a handball, but it was it was outside, outside the, the box. box. So had, how is that a PK? It, it just 
handballs in general. But that save was awesome, and I saw you tweet it, and a, and a, and a bunch of people that. I, being there, that was the loudest, I think, since I've been going to games. That was a crazy pop at Gillette. Crazy. Great. Uh, I mean, he's just so confident he's in so those good. big moments. He's and so it's just good. It's a reminder, by the way, to bring it back to Barrero, why you can't let him go until the season's over. No matter how much money they freaking throw at you this summer. Do not let him go. Please do not let him go. Because if he goes... I think it really does take any chance away from you winning an MLS Cup. You win an MLS Cup this year, and I, he's going to be a big part of that. I Absolutely. don't think you can – You I can't. Can he's, he's going to be a staple of it, and his price will probably And I think if he's not him. here, I don't think you win an MLS Cup. Like, I think he, that's the, he's the difference maker between you being in first place right now and having a similar start to the season that you did last year. Because what, they, this, what this team would be – Maybe without Petro and Net is probably a middle of the table team. Well, I think in Taylor Twelman, he brought yeah. this up, and I and I and I agree with it for the most part. But like, but I think great goalies do mask deficiencies in defense. Even the best defense is going to have mental lapses. They're right. going to get missed. Well, Twelman said the, Twelman said the other day the Revs face the most shots of any team in the league because and Petro covers up a lot of mistakes. And that's and that's my my point is that. This t- I, I can't debate or disagree with what you're saying because he does mask a lot of that. Great goalies do. Mm-hmm. When, when you look at great teams, great defenses, they don't, you don't have a great four or five or three without that one in goal. You don't. And, and, and it's the saves that he's making on top of that that are Ooh. masking some of those mistakes. Ooh. These aren't like, okay, he's in the right spot. They, they, they shot it right at him. He is making ridiculous reactions. Do you know what is, uh, was amazing about that PK save is Beautiful. that – he had him going like oh, Petro yeah. was going the other way, and he moved his body like I don't know how he did that reflex. Full sprawl wise. too. It was it was it was so yeah. good. Go back if you have go back and watch that replay. Acosta had him. He had him bit. He bit one way and then had enough physicality. Can you do it like a physical open. demonstration? Can you stand up and actually like? Come on, stand up. Like, Absolutely not. Why I'm not? not? I'm not a goalie. I wouldn't. I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't do that. That was great. I mean, we got a pretty good one there, though. It, it was, was enough. It, it was a seated. It was a seated. Uh, it was a seated attempt. demonstration. Yeah. Uh, if you have like, four, I, I can do forward and striker stuff, but I'm not going to demonstrate what goalies do. Uh, at the end of the well, day, don't tell people on Twitter that because apparently we don't. You know, we've never played soccer or oh, coach. Please life. don't. Whoever the hell Tommy's friends are. Not my friends. I, I mean, I, I like is, them. I enjoy like, them. I don't. I don't read. They them, put so. them. They put them in. They, one of them has you in their bio. Oh, well, they are my friends. Yeah, they're nerds. They're good. They're good, good listeners. They're good, yeah, good listeners. What did right. they say? I actually, I actually don't know. They, no, he wrote, they're drunk. Wrote. They were upset because the they, he got all right. My, all right, can, hold on. Mikey hey, called out down. the. Mikey I said, call, how can you have faith in the Bruins ever again? They had the historic. They were of, upset Bruins fans. They were drunk. It's late at night. It's Rev's Twitter. What do you expect? It's like a smaller version right. of the Kirk Menahan world. Without uh, the yeah, thing you said enough. There you go. Um, <laughs> Not much more needs to be said on that. The um, which I, we love you, Kirk. Um. So I listen. They're gonna replace Barrero. It's a matter of who do they go out there and get? Do you go out there and get another South American? Which you have that at office down there. You can go find a Brazilian. Go find me a Colombian. Go find me some an Argentinian. Like they have a tremendous amount of resources in that region they're of the world now that they've never sure. had before. So I think there is. A, uh, that's where I think they've got to be targeting right now, and then we'll find out in July. Can I play what, a hypothetical. Just let's play this hypothetical. Is the show that we do. What? I'm, and I'm, I'm. They're going to do that. That's why you have a scouting team. This is what you do constantly. Injury or not, they have MLS. You're doing this all, all across the world. The Revolution rip off five wins mm-hmm. in the next five games. They they are whatever 10, 12 points above everybody else, and whoever is in that position. Regard if it's a revolving door, if it's one player, there, there's no drop off, really. Right? Is it that? Do they still go out? And yes, I yes, think, I yes. Think, you I have think to. you have to because of what the later is it in the dire? season. You know what? You'd rather go in that position as opposed to the opposite, where you lose five in a row and now you're desperate to find somebody. And I think I that's agree. What we I saw agree. I'm just. Th- this is what people are going to say right. if that in hypothetical land. Yeah. I I agree with all that. You can't have enough. Reserves or reinforcements yeah, depth, or great players, you can't. I think that they have you know, they're keeping an eye on what's going on in the CCL too, um, because there's some guys that are going on. You know, like some of the game, the matches that are happening in there, they're probably watching that. They're watching the guys in South America, um, where they seem to be tapped in pretty well now nowadays. Yeah, I think you have to find some of that depth. It's not a dire situation. At, that it maybe would have been last year if this happened early on last year. I think year. a lot of teams would be in trouble. 
losing a piece like that. Big time. But I don't think as, as important as Dylan is and, and as great as he's been and how dynamic he can be, I think that I think they're going to be okay without him. It'll be interesting. I think, again, this weekend is the first test, 7.30 tonight at BMO Field versus Toronto. Yeah, we so. talked about it with Kendra, too. I mean, this is, a, this is a good Toronto team. People table watch and sometimes make a decision about a team. Oh. But the 10 games through – the, a lot of draws, so that that that's this. It's a team that you can't sleep on. And she no. brings up a good point. The Leafs, man, they won their first first round uh, series in the playoffs. Are you so talking they, hockey they, now? I'm talking bringing in the hockey. Yeah, Toronto's gonna be bumping this. Toronto's weekend. gonna Toronto be buzzing. Is, man. Yeah, this they're is, gonna be buzzing. This is a big. This is another. I think this is another big game atmosphere for sure. So. Uh, you're going to find out tonight what this Revs team is made of in the post Dylan Barrero era. I think you'll learn a lot, and hopefully you're more healthy than is you've Roni been. Back? Well, who the hell? Still knows? on the injury report, so he's questionable. But yeah. he wasn't, you know. But Veroni wasn't on the injury report going into the game. Like, I don't freaking know. I, honestly, we find out for the most part when some of these guys are injured. When you do, well, so this, there's this, nothing this, we could do. This is what Bruce does. He has no obligation to give transparent that was injury one of those reports. This weekend when I is walked what it in, is. And they pinged us with the email, and I looked, and there was no Veroni well, even so, on the bench. I go, what, what are we doing here? What this happened? was a point of contention early on in the season because of sports betting, wasn't it? Yep. Some of the de- some of the injury reports that were not being reported does not then, give a damn. And then people are placing bets on you know whatever one way or the other, and these guys don't play. <laughs> so it's like, I mean, the heat, what does he care about? Did you, you didn't have Veroni in that ten team parlay, did you? We we'll back with more after this. <laughs> back a weekly rolling along on this Saturday. Welcome on back in. If you're watching on YouTube, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube page, New England Soccer Weekly on YouTube. Also, subscribe on Apple and wherever you get podcasts and leave a five-star review. It's been a while since we've actually uh, promoted that. Review us and comment on a YouTube, like the video, Go back and watch our other episodes. And tell your friends about it. Now, uh, the big, obviously, Barrero is the story of the week, and the thing that people keep on going back to is... Gillette Stadium turf, Gillette Stadium turf, Gillette Stadium turf. And I'm not a turf fan. I've never been a turf fan. I think we're going to be seeing an age when turf is going to be completely phased out in not just soccer, but in America, but also in the NFL. I think NFL players want to get away from it. Von Miller has a PSA out talking about player safety on top of turf. So we are not a pro turf podcast here. Not going to get anything else from me. We've talked about it before. So it's... The game of soccer is not meant to be played on turf. It, it will be interesting. It will be Concrete interesting to on. see what happens with uh, what happens with turf in twenty twenty six because the World Cup, the World Cup, all the World Cup games are going to be played on grass here. One hundred percent. They're building in grass in Gillette Stadium in twenty twenty six, and then the obvious question is, well, do you keep the grass after you you lay it in? And I think there's a very good chance that past 2026, you'll never see turf again. Well, the Revs might not be playing at Gillette Stadium in 2026, so they might be playing in everything. I don't know. Well, well, I mean, a stadium timeline thing is, you know, they would have to announce by the end of this year yeah, for I mean, it to I'm make just, sense. No, 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 no. no. You want to go down this road? We're going to go down this oh, road boy. now. You did it. You opened up the door. Your fault. His fault. You announced by the end of the year this year – you get the first shovel in the ground by February, maybe, depending on how quickly you're able to turn around construction time and if inflation doesn't continue to bite us in the ass over the next couple of years, uh, maybe you can get that thing open for 2026. The levels I th- on that mic went through the roof there. I think I think realistically Hopefully 2027 looks like more of a realistic option. I mean, you have a lot of hurdles still to, to, to climb. But, yeah, when you get to that Everett Stadium, whenever that happens, you're going to have a grass field there. Well, how long has Gillette Stadium had turf now? It's been, what, 10 years maybe? Less? Got to be long. Longer than that. Turf? I don't know if it's been longer than that. Turf. I don't think they've had turf maybe 10 years. I don't know. I I, I would have to check that. I'd have to look I, into I, would, that. I would say I thought it we went to, to be, turf. Yeah. I thought we went to turf. Because the NFL switched to turf back in the mid-2000s. And the Revs have been playing on that surface. But don't you remember the field, how shoddy it was? And like when they would, especially when you get into the football season. That was, I thought that was early 2000s though. I don't remember. Maybe I'm misremembering, but I'm pretty sure Gillette Stadium had grass up until maybe 10, 15 years ago the most. Regardless, if they do switch, they're going to be doing grass fields there for the World Cup. I 2006. Can, 
2006. All right, so six, 17 years. The revol- off by 17 years. The revolution were the first to try. <laughs> yeah. That's what, wait, you were just off 17 years? 17 years. I mean, come on. That was yesterday. Yeah. So, oh, you said 10 years. So well, I do remember. Seven. Well, 10 years, 17 years. Who's the judge? I'm trying to justify whether or not it would be worth it for them financially to keep the grass there because turf does is a lot less maintenance. Yeah, but it also causes a lot more injuries, and I just I think the technology yeah, of think maintaining a, grass has gotten so much better. From a business standpoint, they make billions of dollars. Are you kidding me? They're trying to save every penny. Still, it doesn't matter. It's a they business. Are billionaires, it, it, and it's not just sports that are played and, and housed at Gillette Stadium. And if yeah, it's, it's, it's it's arena, it's stadiums everywhere. But all, all owners yeah, have we, the same we, mentality. We've, we've done concerts. You, you lay little grates down. It's it's not that. It should not be that hard to maintain grass. And we should not. I, I don't think there should be anybody that's making any case. They do do that at Fenway. Yeah, and the grass looks fine to me. Yeah. So it's it's very well manicured. It's going to be interesting to see how the league as a whole approaches the turf conversation. Because I mean, we when we talk about it with Kindra too, the other thing is is that you know Portland plays on turf. They have a soccer specific stadium, but they play on turf, and they've had guys get injured this year because of, uh, or guys in the past get injured because of turf issues out there. So um, all around, it's something that the league has to get away from. Because, as you see in the recent world football evaluations of how much clubs are worth nowadays, imagine how much more a Seattle Sounders or an Atlanta United would be if they played on a grass field, hmm. right? Just, if they didn't also soccer, and, and maybe may, and maybe that's a stupid thing no, to say, but it kind of is... feels like it would they the value would still would go up on the team. I, I'm not if they on a real field. The soccer fans. You that follow the show, us that cover it, we the, it's a, it's a niche. This is a world here, and if you play the game, if you watch the game, the game is better on grass. Ask any player what they would rather play on; they would say grass. So the quality of the product is going to go up with the terrain being switched as well. In my opinion, I mean, yeah, the game's uh, different, Mike. You watch EPL, game, you watch everything else all week. The, the game games, is different. The games would be different in MLS if they were all played on grass. The quality to me would be better because players play different on grass than they do on turf. It's a different game. It's a different game. It's a slower game uh, because the turf is just a, an equal level throughout the whole field. It's ball rolls. It's flat. Well, the, the weight of your passes. The weight, weight of your pass is different. You don't. You know. But I, I just think personally, as somebody who always just enjoyed playing on grass better. It feels better. It's it's softer to land on. Uh, slide tackling, everything is just better on a grass field. Well, and and it, if they're going to be bringing it in for the World Cup in 2026 anyways, I don't see why you would bring that in it's and also, then go back to turf. It just makes no sense. It's also about the type of player you recruit. You know, certain well, players will never like, play on turf. Like Thierry, Zlatan never played on any – like a lot of European players – Thierry Henry never, never did. They won't play on turf. Thierry Henry, the only time he played on turf here at Gillette Stadium was they in the Eastern Conference Finals. Right, uh, uh, in 2014 How'd versus the Revs, uh, they lost in the second leg, and the Revs moved on to these uh, to the uh, MLS Cup Finals. So, um, but I mean that you know there are players that just don't. I, I think David Beckham. I mean, yeah, David Beckham didn't play on turf. He just came here and waved. Right, that was pretty much. No, nah, he played. I was there. He was, played at Gillette I Stadium. There was one where he just sat on the sideline. He played at Gillette Stadium. I'd have Stadium. to go back and I'd have to go play. back in time and look. I was but, there for that, like back in oh eight. So, yeah, a couple of years after. I mean, if you want to get turf. messy here, you're going to have to get grass in, right? Yeah. Messi's going to Miami, and we'll talk about that He's after the next break. But I will He's say real quick. Um, He's going back to Barca. There's this Eli Lesser that is hooked up with the league. He's sponsored by Body Armor, but he also has a connection with the league where he gets free jerseys just to pretty much pump the league's tires and be you know a cheerleader for the league. Uh, but he put out a video saying, is, "Is this who you were going back and forth on?" Yes, Twitter because with? I because th- it's because it. he said in his video he was talking about the Barrero injury with, and he was blaming turf, but he also blamed turf on Henry Kessler's injury. Now I wouldn't have been so upset about this if this kid wasn't as connected to the league as he is. Mm. So without any concrete information, he's going out there and saying that turf caused Henry's injury uh, to his hamstring, which led to him getting uh, taken out for four months. We've never officially heard what caused this injury that's taken Henry out for the next four months. What I will say is this. I'll tell you what I know first. This injury is something that came over from 
last year. So Eli's video that's talking about Henry getting hurt on turf, and turf is the reason why Henry's out for the next four months, BS. It's garbage, and he won't take down the video, which I find even more astonishing because he's a new house student, and that would never be acceptable at Syracuse. Next topic. Boy. I thought we were going to do one and done yeah, in a season getting. that Tom was going at someone else no, for, we, we got, reporting we're getting, something, but here we are again. We're getting deep in the Big J battle. Let's go. So, Big J for journalism. You know, Henry's injury came over from <laughs> something that lingered from last year into this year. They took him out as a precaution versus Montreal. He had it examined, and... It was a situation where Henry didn't necessarily, from what I'm hearing, didn't necessarily need the surgery now, but decided to get it now because if he did further injure that hamstring, that right hamstring, which has bothered him since last year, it probably would have resulted in a more long-term injury. So this is pretty much maybe the, the easy way to describe it, like Tommy John. Okay, right. Follow? We're follow. Okay. So Barely, but you're I'm following? following. Yes. Okay. Like, you, you do this to kind yes. of... This is similar to, like, when my wife's talking to me about work, and I'm like, yes, honey. Tom, Tom I'm just saying. Go, continue. This is, a, this is a show of truth, Tom. What do you want? It's like Tommy John surgery. You, you, not all pitchers need Tommy John surgery. Preventative. It's preventative. Yes. yes preventative. I, I was, so, at, it was why, a joke. So why are you going at this person? So what's wrong with Eli? Yeah. Elio, Eli. Oh, because Eli. he's saying that Henry's injury came as a result of the Gillette Stadium turf, and well, just be accurate. About it was just a lingering. But could last year's injury that was Tom's, lingering? Tom's tweeting him like, "This is how you." Well, report. it wasn't. It was this never. Is, this is how you be. Henry's oh, injury. you're big timing him. Henry, Henry came into the season injured, so we don't know if Henry got hurt on turf. He came into that season last year injured. Mm. Remember, I don't think he he didn't start the game against Portland last year. He didn't start the season off. This year? Last year. Oh, God, last year. I know, it's a blur yeah, for the most part. It's a blur. So, there you go. I just wanted to clear that up because that uh, irritated me this week. Let's wrap up the show next. All right, wrapping up New England Soccer Weekly, Kendra de St. Aubin, thank you so much for coming on. Make sure you watch her tonight as the Revs take on Toronto FC, 730 from BMO Field. Uh, Apple. MLS season pass. We do need to spend more time when we can to talk about. Maybe we'll talk to somebody at MLS about this eventually. But the idea that Messi comes to the league because it seems like he's fed up with. Well, he's done. P- yeah, he's, That's he's done been with PSG. reported that he is out at PSG at the end of the season. Now, do you, do, does MLS need Messi? That'll be. I don't think that they need. But whatever. We'll see. If that's, a, that's a deeper discussion than we have time for right now. What do you think happens you this know, weekend? You don't think they need the league? Doesn't need Messi? I mean, it'd be nice. I don't think they need it. Can't hurt. Doesn't no, make it... but you ask if they well, need. If you... They don't need Messi to stay Let, alive. So if right? Messi's on Miami and the I Revs are getting thirty k, how much more are they going to get at Gillette Stadium? I, I think it would be great for the league. It would be a they sellout. Don't, they don't need what I mean. So I think they do. I don't think they need Messi. I think it, it doesn't it, make it, or break the you know league what that right is? now. Like it's it does. David it's a band aid. It's a band aid. That's all it is. It's temporary. What happens when he leaves after a year? Well, it depends if he's going to be an owner, right? Is he? Gonna, are you going to do what you did with David Beckham with Messi? You're not going to go to the game to watch him in the owner's box. I'll tell you who would love it is who we just – is Apple would love that. Yeah, yeah. Apple would it love would, it. It would drive up ratings. You know I, 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 listen, I, the league does not need Messi. We've talked about it with countless personalities from Apple that they're, they're, the focus is on driving and building your own stars here. Messi would be fantastic for the league. It would bring in a lot of ticket sales. You know, and you know, potentially more su- subscriptions to MLS season pass, but it's a temporary fix. It's not a long term. The league has done an incredible job building these new franchises, building their own stars. That's what the focus needs to continue to be on. And by the way, it is not happening. He's going to back to Barcelona. It's basically a done deal. I'm not reporting that. It, I'm just going based off of the the line scoops. He's got a check mark. Well, no, now, so. it, it's no, it's there is. You know, it's been reported already that he's done with PSG at the end of the season. He's suspended currently from them for two weeks. The next two weeks, he can't even go to practice because of his trip to Saudi. I don't think he's going to Saudi because it appears Ronaldo's out of there. They're buddies, believe it or not. He's probably telling them, I did not enjoy my time there. It's not a lifestyle for us. Messi wants to go back to Barcelona. He still wants to compete at a high level. That's his home club. Where does Ronaldo want to go? He wants to go back. Yeah, he might be done. Ronaldo might be done. Ronaldo might yeah. go back to Madrid as an ambassador, potential future coach. I, I think Ronaldo 
is on the, the end of his career right now. If it, He might stick it out with Saudi another year, but that's it. We'll spend more time talking about Messi another time. Real quick, Revs win this weekend, or is it a tie? Or is it a loss? I, you know, I, you know what? I, I, th- I think the Revs do win this weekend. I think the Revs go up there and make a statement. I Look think you. There you go, Tom. A statement win. Oh, no. Is Mikey takes. Well, he's won one. He said, has there been a convincing win yet? This yeah, is but your we gave convincing him win. One, but just not convincing to him. I'm saying this is going to be the convincing win, the hashtag wow, any revs. Wow, so this is what Tom is looking for. And, you know, I, and if they don't, then I can have these guys replying me, to asking me if I know anything about sports again. I go by the eyeball test. I watch a lot of Toronto FC over the last 48 hours. I, I think that the Revolution are a better team, but history this year says a draw. So I'm going to go. I don't know what the score is, but I will say it finishes in a draw. Kind of feel, I feel it feels like a 1-1 draw yeah. up there in Toronto, and I think that'd be fine. I think the Revs go up there and they shock the world. The, the, better, t- the better team shocks the world by winning. Yes. Got it. All right, we're out of here. See you next week. Thank you to Kindred Day St. Aubin. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. And thank you, Bruce. Great. Thank you.